Welcome to everyone to our fifth health equity learning series of the year. I got some great words of advice before I came up here. Uh, normally, our CEO, Ned Kalange, does this. Um, but I got uh, some good advice from a colleague just now. Uh, don't screw it up. So I'm not going to try not to screw it up. Um, as I said, welcome to everyone to our fifth uh, learning series uh, event this, this year. Uh, before we introduce our speakers, I wanted to mention a, a couple of things. Last week, the Colorado Health Institute released a 2013 Colorado Health Access Survey. F findings highlight that disparities exist in our state, revealing that our incomes, our zip code, and our race ethnicity increases our chances of being uninsured. Um, the survey also showed that Hispanic and black Coloreds are more likely to report poor health status compared to white, their white counterparts. These conditions are rooted in a number of inequities that our speakers will address today. In addition, you'll be hearing from our distinguished speakers um, and, and as well as some uh, materials that they've provided at your tables. By the way, I think I already screwed it up. My name is Chris Armijo. <laughs> I'm a program officer here at the Colorado Trust. So thanks for the advice that I clearly didn't follow. Um, also what you'll find um, on, there's also a number of publications on your table. The first is the Colorado Trust recently announced uh, their new vision for health equity for uh, dedicated to achieving health equity. Uh, to create health equity, we believe that all Coloradans should have fair and equal oppor opportunities. We believe that all Coloradans should have fair and equal opportunities to lead healthy, productive lives, regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or where we live. Partnering with communities, we can advance fair and equal opportunities for all Coloradans to be healthy. You can learn more about our vision um, with the uh, the fact sheet that we've left on everyone's table. What you'll also find on your table are two articles from our speakers today. The first is a patient-centered medical home article. Oh, patient-centered medical home, a path toward equity, uh, uh, authored by one of our speakers, Dr. Dr. Winston Wong, and also a second article, The Ethics of Medical Model in Addressing Root Causes of Health Disparities in Local Public Health, which was authored by Dr. Anthony Eiten. Along with these materials, you'll also find a discussion guide so you can continue this conversation beyond today. Uh, finally, you'll have highlights from a new Colorado Trust report about diversifying the healthcare workforce. Um, as many of our reports, there were several com contributors to this, this report, and those individuals are Suzuho Shimasaki, who wrote the brief, and Sherry Walker, who served as an editor. Thanks to both of you for your work on that. Um, these materials and other resources can be found on our newly refreshed website, coloradotrust.org. In addition, I'm looking right at Mauricio, he brought some reports from the Office of Health Equity, hot off the presses, that he's willing to share or put on the tables there in the back. So if you would like to pick up one of those on your way out, um, that would be great. I also want to acknowledge our virtual participants. Um, who are participating in virtual or viewing parties throughout the state. Um, there's approximately 300 people outside of this room participating in this conversation, in this dialogue, and we want to acknowledge them. Alamosa, Colorado Springs, Durango, Eagle, Fort Collins, Frisco, Grand Junction, Gunnison, Lamar, Leadville, Montrose, Monta Vista, Pueblo, Rifle, Steamboat, Telluride, and Yuma. Feels like a shout out in my last hip hop album or something. Um, so welcome to all of those people participating across the state. I also wanna recognize our board members that are here with us today. Um, Reverend RJ Ross and Don Mares, thanks for joining us today. Um, finally, we're using social media for today's event. If you'd like to follow the conversation on Twitter using hashtag healthequitytct, you may also submit your questions via Twitter. Also available, we have an email address, healthequity at coloradotrust.org that you can submit questions to. And we'll do our best to answer all of the questions for those in the room and those participating via live stream. Um, so to get started today, I'm pleased to introduce two experts dedicated to achieving health equity. Uh, Drs. Anthony Eiten and Winston Wong are definitely trailblazers and important thought leaders in this field. We are very lucky to have them here today. We know that healthcare is necessary, but not sufficient to achieving health equity. Or as Dr. Dr. Eiten so eloquently puts it, we can't, we can't treat social ills with pills. Uh, the purpose of bringing Drs. Eiten and Wong to Colorado is to share their perspectives sitting in different systems about how we can all 
address social determinants of health. Dr. Eitan and his colleagues at the California, California Endowment are adjusting social determinants of health through a community-driven approach, while Dr. Wong, positioned in Kaiser, a large healthcare system, is pushing the envelope by advancing key conversations with his colleagues to understand that community health is as important to their mission as delivering healthcare. I'm really looking forward to this rich and important dialogue. First, we will hear from Dr. Anthony Eiten from the California Endowment with a background in medicine, public health, law. Dr. Eiten's primary focus includes the health of disadvantaged populations and the contributions of race, class, wealth, education, geography, and employment to health status. Uh, then we will hear from Dr. Winston Wong from Kaiser Permanente. For over 30 years, Dr. Wong has worked to reduce health disparities for underserved populations to improve health care for everyone. Following their presentations, Dr. Eins and Wong will engage in a discussion where we will take questions from the audience. So now uh, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Anthony Eiten, Senior Vice President for Healthy Communities uh, from at the California Endowment. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's, a, it's always a pleasure to be here now uh, in Colorado uh, because I have asthma and uh, the altitude always makes me a little short of breath. So I feel like I'm excited to be here, um, but uh, it's really, I'm just short of breath. So uh, I want to thank Chris and, and the work that the Colorado Trust is doing and uh, the staff of the Colorado Trust uh, for inviting Winston and I here uh, today uh, to have this dialogue. And um, this is fun for us when it's interactive. Um, I, we talk about this a lot. And so um, just sitting here talking at you is less fun than having you kind of challenge us with thoughts, ideas, or experiences that influence the way you approach your work. So we look forward to having a robust question and answer um, uh, session, and we hope that the remote folks as well can participate uh, through questions, and we're happy to answer questions both online and offline. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm a data junkie. I apologize for that um, at the outset. I, I always walk around with slides. I always carry around too many slides. Um, when we were planning this, um, Chris was kind of begging us not to use slides, not to use too many slides, and I was like, sorry, buddy. I just got to do it. But I promised that I would get through these really quickly. So I'm going to kind of march through them because I think that there's some basic concepts here, and I've tried to organize it into the format of an argument. So you see basically what I'm saying is sort of structured in the format of an argument. And, and, and I'm a lawyer, too, so I like to argue. Um, but I'm more of a doctory kind of lawyer. I like uh, data. Okay, so this is the basic take-home message that health is political. And it's a small p political, meaning it's not partisan political. It's not Republicans and Democrats and independents all have an interest in health. What I'm talking about are the processes by which communities achieve health or access health opportunities. And one definition of politics is it's the struggle over the allocation of scarce and precious social goods. And as I said uh, last night when we were having dinner, that um, those scarce and precious social goods are not esoteric things. We're talking about things like a park or a grocery store. The way that those health protective resources are essentially distributed in our society depends on the ability of people to participate in the processes where those decisions are made. And those communities that don't have the opportunity or the wherewithal to participate actively tend to get the short end of the stick. And that has an impact on the health of those communities. So here's the argument. Where you live influences how long you live. Policy and politics shapes the neighborhood design and resources, i.e. how we've had historically inner cities and Chinatowns and barrios and the, uh, and the like. Three, living in a resource-deprived community is chronically stressful. This is the most important piece of it. It's stress that drives the adverse health outcomes. Chronic stress produces chronic disease. Medical, medical care is a necessary but insufficient tool to address uh, chronic stress. That's the argument. Here's the data. So 
Uh, I used to be the Alameda County, which is in Oakland, uh, public health director and health officer. And one of the things that we had in Alameda County, and actually all counties have it, and I'd love to see it for Denver, quite frankly, um, is death certificates. When you're the health officer, you're the registrar of all births and deaths. And there are about um, 10,000 deaths in Alameda County every year, and we had a database that went back into the 1950s. So we're able to actually characterize patterns of death uh, across, uh, you know, uh, basically 45, 50, 60 years. So we did that. Um, one of the analyses that you can do is you can actually look at the neighborhoods. In this case, it's census tracts. There are about 10,000 people in every census tract in Alameda County, and you can calculate the average age to which people live in those neighborhoods. And when we did that, we found that there are concentrations of premature death um, in Alameda County. Those red areas are neighborhoods where people live, on average, less than 74 years, in some cases into the mid-60s. And so we wanted to understand why this was concentrating in those neighborhoods. These particular neighborhoods are neighborhoods in Oakland, sometimes referred to as the Oakland Flatlands, East Oakland and West Oakland. And there's some sprinkled other uh, low life expectancy neighborhoods in Alameda County as well. Now, it's not just Alameda County. Uh, we've actually partnered with other health departments around the country. This is the Cuyahoga County uh, Cleveland Health Department. This is Baltimore, Maryland. This is Los Angeles. This is uh, Seattle King County. You find these wherever you look. Dramatic life expectancy differences by neighborhood on the order of about 20 years. Just think about that for a second. In the same city, on average, people can expect to live two decades less than some of their neighbors in other neighborhoods. So at the California Endowment, we've tried to promote this shocking notion that your zip code is more important than your genetic code when it comes to health. And so we've basically advertised this. This is the Metreon building in San Francisco uh, during the uh, American Public Health Association meeting last year when it was held in San Francisco. We literally festooned the side of a building uh, with this message. Okay, so policy politics shapes neighborhoods and resources. Now, are there any lawyers in the room? Okay, good, I can say all kinds of disparaging things about lawyers then. Uh, no, in this case, I want to say something good about lawyers. Um, when you're, I'm a lawyer, and when you're a lawyer, you can actually, there's some things that you can do quite easily. One of them, one of them and we did this in Alameda County, was to research property deeds to try to understand why is it that some people living in some neighborhoods have access to less resources, and why are our neighborhoods racially segregated? And so we found a number of deeds. This is from a lawsuit uh, in the 1950s, and this was a provision in a deed. It's called a racially restrictive covenant, and it reads, no person or persons of the Mexican race, uh, you know, you, you can use your imagination to define what that means, or other than the Caucasian race, note the Caucasian is all in capitals because it's important, um, <laughs> shall use or occupy any building or any lot except that this covenant shall not prevent occupancy by domestic servants of a different race domiciled with an owner, tenant, or occupant thereof. That's a racially restrictive covenant, and there are thousands of them in Alameda County, and to this day, they're still legal. They're unenforceable, since the 1950s, but they're, they run in perpetuity with the land. I've had three houses in Alameda County. They all say that I should never, ever be able to live there. That's the reality. We had apartheid in this country. We established separate conditions, separate living spaces uh, for different people, and it was enforced by the federal government. This is the Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual in the 1930s. And it says it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial groups. So I'm going through this fairly quickly. Um, I could take you through a history of redlining and show you the consequences of redlining in a number of different communities. Understand that this is not accidental. These were federal policies that were enforced at the federal level, at the state level, and at the local level. Uh, we have a legacy of exclusionary policies and redlining, these racially restrictive covenants, school segregation, school funding, uh, health insurance, and the various strata of health insurance that people have access to. 
transportation policies, predatory lending, affordable housing, subprime lending, uh, present day immigration policies, uh, gay marriage policies, and, and preclusions against uh, those kinds of marriages, on the legacy of the Social Security Act, which uh, excluded domestic workers, excluded agricultural workers, uh, the GI Bill, the list goes on and on. So you live in a poor neighborhood, so what? Everybody has a story of their grandmother who you know, grew up in the barrio and worked hard and pulled herself up by the bootstraps and now she's CEO of Xerox. And if she can do it, anybody can do it. You have those stories, come on. So in 1993, um, the seminal article came out by uh, McGinnis and Fahey, um, who talked about you know, trying to get public health to stop talking about diseases and started, start talking about the, what they call the actual causes of death, and they said there are only four of them. The environment, um, lack of access to health care, biology or genes, and then lifestyle. And that was, a, that was a provocative article in 1993. Since that time, we recognize that the barrier between environment and biology is kind of a porous barrier. We have this phenomenon of epigenetics, which basically means that if you take two identical twins and put them in radically different environments, their genes express themselves differently due to the environment. The environment shapes ge genetic expression. That's interesting, but that's actually not the interesting one I want to talk about. I want to talk about this lifestyle one. This whole notion of sort of, it's all about personal responsibility. People like my grandmother, who's now Xerox chairman, made the right decisions. And if she could make it, all of these other people could make it too. And let's, let's, be, let's be straight here. Personal responsibility does matter. But we also know that environments shape people's choices. And environments are powerful determinants of people's range of options. They also directly create stress. And stress actually encourages certain types of behaviors that we consider injurious to health. This whole notion of allostasis, the outside world causing essentially changes in the body's physiology, has developed dramatically over the past few years. We now know that acute stress, which is in the blue, which is good for you, it gives you essentially the kind of boost you need when you're in a challenging situation, but over long periods of time, it does almost the exact opposite to you. It causes hypertension, cardiovascular disease, it causes glucose intolerance and insulin resistance, it actually increases your inflammatory responses, decreases your immunity, and changes and atrophies neurons, primarily in your frontal cortex and in your hippocampus, which are responsible for executive function, decision-making that allows you to essentially delay gratification. We don't live in a meritocratic society. We know that smart, hardworking, low-income kids go to college at a rate of about 78%. Uh, we know that dumb, lazy, rich kids go to college at roughly the same rate. This is not a meritocracy. So the argument here is that um, there's a medical model, and it basically focuses on, on essentially dealing with people in a clinical situation, and it talks about essentially trying to change their risk behaviors, try to modify their disease, and try to prevent their death. And it, it's expensive, and it's necessary. Our argument is that they're also uh, a complementary socio-ecological model over which we have some influence, and, and we have ignored the influence that we have over the socio-ecological conditions that create the demand on the healthcare system, and we're just arguing that while we have to work downstream, we also have to look at definitive opportunities to intervene upstream that make sense that are within our control, and that's the whole argument here. The world of health disparities lives downstream, primarily in the healthcare delivery system. The world of health inequities lives upstream. You can take the word health out and just talk about inequities produce disparities. And if you're a simple-minded person like me, you just talk about conditions producing consequences. And we deal to the tune of $2.8 trillion in the world of consequence management, or sometimes I refer to it as damage control. And we ignore, for the most part, the conditions that create the risk that lead to the likelihood of poor health. So very simply, the medical model says bad behaviors produce higher rates of disease, which produce greater likelihoods of premature death. The socio-ecological model says 
that are a set of bad societal behaviors, both the legacy of them and present day behaviors that devalue certain populations, that lead to a set of policies and practices that skew resources away from populations depending on their favored status in society, that lead to communities, whole communities that are on life support. And we have interventions to try to prevent death. We call them emergency rooms. We have interventions to try to uh, modify disease. We call that the clinical space. We have interventions to try to change behavior. We call that health education. All these things are important and necessary, and we should continue to do them. But we want to reduce the demand on them by looking at these neglected communities and thinking about what are the interventions that we can bring to bear that have meaningful impacts on people's livelihoods in these communities our particular approach at the California Endowment is, a, is, we call it building power in place, building social, political, and economic power so people can participate more effectively in decision-making processes and reshape the environments that have impacts directly on their lives. We think that that in itself is insufficient. We also have to look at the policies and practices, do health impact assessments of policies, non-health policies, um, share data in different ways, use mapping and other tools that make public health data more accessible to policymakers. We think that even that is insufficient. We also have to change the narrative about what health is. Health is not just about your access to the doctor. Health is not just about whether you choose to smoke or not exercise or eat uh, you know, bad diets. Health is also about the, the environments that we create that are man-made, that shape the opportunities for different populations to actually pursue healthy lives. So we're looking for a different kind of narrative which talks about inclusion and sustainable practices. We'd like to see our policies include the concept of health as a value, and we're trying to build resilient and transformed communities. That's our vision, that's our goal, and our strategy um, is, I think, fairly simple. Um, we can talk about it um, later. This is my last slide, I think. And um, it just is a reminder of how much money we expend in our healthcare delivery system and how little value we get for it, for it, which is not to say that it's not important. It is necessary, but it's insufficient. And we need to think about that $2.8 trillion in a very focused way because the impact that it's having on our state governments, on our local governments, on the federal government, the current debate around healthcare, around cost control, it's driving a crisis in virtually every endeavor of American activity. And we're smarter than this. We can use our critical thinking skills to come up with strategies to try to take the demand off the healthcare delivery system, particularly early in life, particularly in communities where there's so much concentrated disadvantage. Again, the argument is where you live influences how long you live, policy and politics shapes those neighborhood conditions and the resources available to people. Living in a resource-deprived community is chronically stressful. Stress promotes chronic disease in an entirely preventable way. Medical care is a necessary but inefficient tool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arton. Um, now please help me uh, welcome Dr. Winston Wong, Medical Director for Community Benefit at Kaiser Permanente. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Uh, um, it's great to be with you today in Colorado and uh, share with you some of my thoughts. And it was interesting as Chris was talking to us, and, and, and Ned um, certainly was very instrumental in inviting both of us here. I think we were anticipating a little bit of um, point counterpoint. Uh, it's not quite that, of course. Uh, I think, as you'll hear my sentiments, 99% um, of what Tony just shared with you, I endorse and heartily agree, and as he knows, I'm, I'm part of the endowment's board, so certainly a direction that we feel, and I feel personally, is critical in terms of the future of our country in terms of achieving health equity. Uh, but I have to say, too, it's, it's difficult to follow Tony. He's kind of the rock star of uh, zip code is more important than genetic code, uh, and I really enjoy hearing Tony speak. We never have a chance to. Now, I do want to ask you, um, how many of you in the audience are in clinical settings or a clinical provider? Okay, maybe about 20 or 30 percent. And the thoughts I have to share with you um, are very much related to the fact that I'm a family practitioner and I'm a primary care provider. 
Um, I continue to see patients at a federally qualified health center, and my patients are um, immigrants, uh, Chinese speaking, um, and in low-income communities. And part of my thoughts that you see in the paper that I co-authored with a number of colleagues had to do with a personal sense of, well, it's actually a cathartic kind of exercise, existentialist, in terms of what am I doing as a primary care provider in the setting of caring for patients that are impacted by social determinants? And should I just kind of throw up my hands and basically say that I need to um, become totally a pu public health advocate and or a social activist and not really consider how I interact with patients in the clinical setting. Now, I think all of you who see patients in a clinical setting realize there is a very special relationship that clinicians have with patients. And even if you're not a clinician, as you reflect on your experience speaking to your doctor, to your physician assistant, to your nurse practitioner, there's something that's very critical that happens in that interaction. And it is something that I believe um, why I entered medicine. I speak to medical students about what this special relationship is. There's something that's been corrupted, I would say, in that relationship over the last generation or so as the medical industrial complex has developed. But I still think it has a very critical role, a central role, in terms of establishing this whole issue of how we relate to patients as part of a community, part of a neighborhood, part as families, and how that relates to the question of social determinants. There has been an inordinate amount of energy, resources, time, looking at the patient-centered medical home. Now, as those of you who know about the history of the patient-centered medical home, it goes back to the mid-60s, where the American Academy of Pediatrics said, we need medical homes for our kids with special needs. So it was resurrected in the last 10 years and said, you know what? It's more than just caring for patients in a unit of service, in a fee-for-service environment. It's about thinking about the continuity of care and how physicians and the healthcare team need to surround themselves with regards to what it means to care for patients and that patients are at the center of what we do. Now, the NCQA uh, took on this, uh, one of the groups, uh, I think the Joint Commission has, did as well, is in terms of trying to codify what these issues of the patient center medical home are. So I'll tell you what these um, units of analysis in terms of how you can verify that a patient practice is indeed patient-centered, a physician practice is indeed patient-centered. One is to have in enhanced access and continuity. Two is to identify and, um, and address the patient populations. Number three is to plan and manage care. Number four, provide self-care, support for self-care as well as community support for patients. And five, track and coordinate care, and finally, measure and improve performance. See, these were the basic tenets of how you could prove, and this is really associated with very tangible financial incentives, that you are patient-centered. So I thought about this, and I said, you know what? This is a course that is indeed good. But I was also mindful of um, this whole paradigm, which I think actually uh, Tony referred to in terms of the, um, the McGinnis article, that if we really understand medical care, it's only maybe about 10% of what ultimately results in health. So if we invest so much in the patient-centered medical home, are we actually fooling ourselves that we achieve some sense of better health for our communities? Now, I actually like this particular graphic a little bit more than the one Tony showed because it suggests that this is a dynamic process, right? That these are gears that move. Now, I also argue, though, that even though under this particular graphic, that medical care perhaps represents 10% of the equation in terms of ultimate health, as we can see in today's headlines, literally, 
that medical care 10% aspect has a lot of torque, a lot of torque in the social condition in which we talk about in our country. The fact is 10% of it, our, our total health is related to medical care, but 18% of the GDP is invested in medical care. So the question is, how do you exploit this aspect of 10% but being disproportionately having more power in terms of defining how health is going to be rendered and ultimately delivered for our country? So relative to patient-centered medical home, I think we understand that there's shortcomings around the PCMH, despite all this activity that's put into trying to accredit different organizations to become PCMHs. Now, what is it about the PCMH that fa falls short? Well, as you recall, I went down through these five different criteria in terms of what a PCMH is. It's basically a sickness care model. Arguably, it's not even patient-centered. It's about patients and, or it's about physicians and their healthcare teams delivering on an outcome that is premise on people becoming sick and entering into the healthcare system. It is not about wellness, it's not about health, it's not about what do practices do relative to investing in the conditions in which people find a formula for health and a way to stay well. I dare say the primary care practitioners, like me, who were serving in federally qualified health centers and community clinics had very little to do with trying to describe what are the essential components of the PCMH. Because if we were, we would have said caring for hypertension for a woman in Upper East Side, New York City is a little bit different taking, than taking care of a person with high blood pressure in the inner city, whether it be in Chicago or Baltimore or New York City. It's a different set of conditions in terms of how you talk to that patient and how do you leverage the resources in a community. So I was actually quite critical of all this energy that was being pushed towards the PCMH, recognizing that it had some hope, but certainly short on delivering on community health. Now, this is kind of the model that I've been looking at a little bit more, is to recognize, as I referenced earlier, that very unique relationship between patient and physician, patient and caretaker, is that we are talking about patients. We're talking about individuals who are either ill or want to maintain their healthy, their, their, their health status, their wellness status. They're part of a larger unit of circumstances. And it's a dynamic process of which we can understand how patients who come into our setting are influenced by different aspects in their home, in their neighborhood, and in the broader society and community. And I think that's what Tony's point was. Now, my point is, yes, that is this whole issue of the interrelationship between the socio-ecologic and the patient, um, the patient experience. What is it about the social determinants of health model that for me actually fall up short related to what I can do as a primary care provider in a community. So this is a variant on what Tony had showed earlier in terms of his diagram of showing the relationship between socio-ecologic models and the medical model. And I would say this is a little bit more where I think relative to the previous slide which showed the individual at the top of the pyramid. Because, uh, let's see if this pointer works. Hope it does. Clinical care and prevention, maybe 20%, 10%, does indeed have an impact on social economic factors and physical environments, which I think the social determinants um, paradigm sometimes doesn't realize or doesn't uh, acknowledge the role of health care as being part of the social determinants of health. I even have a problem with the concept of social determinants of health to a certain degree. I believe that they're heavily influential, but I believe it also sometimes narrows our focus in terms of investing in things like supermarkets, like parks, which are important, 
but more importantly, it's the social capital that is built in the investment of things. And in the investment in terms of political power, which I know Tony talks a lot about. It's not about saying that we're going to invest $10 million into an economic zone to build supermarkets. It's about what does an investment like that mean for empowering communities and how people get engaged into the system. Now, if you say that, then you actually make an argument that the healthcare system itself, healthcare providers, clinics in a given environment have a lot to do with the social and economic factors. Now, why do I say that? So there's actually an intuitive aspect to this. Because if you go back and look at all the ways that people related to healers historically throughout communities, traditional healers, shamans, herbalists, those folks that have always represented who people went to to seek comfort, to seek support, to seek a way to become better in the face of illness. The healers, not necessarily the medical model, Western medical model, the healers would always relate the aspect of how an individual was manifesting certain aspects of wellness or illness in relationship to a broader community. So there's an important aspect of how we think about investment into the healthcare system that modifies the medical model that gets to what we really talk about health and empowering communities. So I don't want to make such a stark demarcation between the medical model, medical model and the social ecologic model. I think there's actually a third space where when one seeks medical care, when one seeks health care, when, when, when one seeks prevention, that healthcare providers have a very critical role in framing this, this, the discussion as well as activating neighborhoods, activating patients, activating communities in terms of how to think how this could occur. Now, what are the examples? I don't just say this because uh, it's just my uh, argument. I draw this from some personal experience. So as I mentioned to you, I'm a primary care provider, a family practitioner in Oakland Chinatown. In our FQHC, we would have earnest discussions. And I've had these discussions with my patients themselves. They said they went to the hospital and they were stuck in the waiting room for four hours because no one could speak to them in their language. The conversation I would have with my patients is, you know what? It is your right your right to ask for interpretation. You are a taxpayer, you're a citizen of this community, therefore, we do not have to passively sit by where you become just a passive consumer of whatever the system gives you. You need to be an advocate, and you need to be part of our advocacy movement at our community health center. So we used to actually activate hundreds of non-English speaking immigrant Asians who were not used to the American system and have a town hall in their language, we would have real time and translation and interpretation and have the community talk about what were the healthcare needs in their community, articulate these and actually bus a number of folks down to the city hall or to the county board of supervisors to make their case. So that is an illustration of how when one gets into the conversation in this very unique relationship that a healer has with patients, that there is a bridge towards talking about broader issues of community empowerment. The other aspect of this is when I tour people around Oakland Chinatown, I will say, do we need a supermarket in Oakland Chinatown? We do not need a supermarket in Oakland Chinatown. There are plenty of groceries that have fresh vegetables, fresh food. Do we need better schools? Arguably, we do, but there are actually Chinese language schools that many of the kids go to after school. Do we need more help for elders and seniors? Absolutely. Many of them live in isolated housing situations, but many of them are part of an extended family where the grandma is actively in care of their grandchildren. What we do need is political empowerment. And if you look historically at various communities, it's always been a question of political empowerment. And my, my 
my, my argument is if we look narrowly in terms of social determinants and we think merely in terms of investments, we've actually missed the boat here. It's about investments that are related to community empowerment and investments for making voices in communities. There's another example that's not just the medical model that is related to community empowerment. And I'm not sure how, how we sometimes forget this, but if you look at the HIV epidemic, it started off as a medical issue in terms of this infection causing people to be immune compromised, causing untold mortality, loss of years of people in the most productive life, a portion of their life. But the real work that occurred around the HIV community was around empowerment in terms of making the political voice strong that prevention as well as access and research was critical. And one could argue that the HIV community has done perhaps the most powerful job in terms of changing the dynamic between the medical model and crossing the bridge around social ecological issues. So I want to show you, um, when I, as I wind up here, how maybe we can look at a reformed medical model or healthcare delivery system that takes into account community empowerment, takes into account that the healthcare team has a very specific and unique relationship to patients. And this has to do with the mapping that I think uh, Tony actually showed relative to his role at, at the county, Alameda County Health Department. This is actually Kaiser Permanente data. Okay. So these are our maps for our members, and you can see this is asthma prevalence hotspots. These are Kaiser Permanente members living in the Bay Area, and you can see where the red spots are, where there's high prevalence of asthma, high prevalence of hypertension, high prevalence of obesity, and high prevalence of diabetes. The red marks are always consistent. And they track where our members, who are fully insured, live, as Tony said, but also represents, if you're a community provider, what is your specific and unique opportunity to change the community balance of power here? And is there a role that Kaiser Permanente plays? Is there a role as a primary care provider plays in terms of investing into how we see people taking control of their lives individually, their neighborhoods, and their communities? And we at KP are going through this journey. I won't tell you that if you went to KP tomorrow that you're going to have this very earnest discussion with your internist. But I will say that we're trying to put this into the formula, into the, dis into the dis discussion. Because if we think about healthcare in the 21st century, we can't think of it solely in the terms of the medical model. Nor would I say we can solely think of it as solely a social determinants model. It's about social influences. And as Tony said, I think much of this is related to how we're starting to understand the juxtaposition, the interface between individual manifestations of disease and stress and the community influences of stress and how people can become more activated to be empowered to work on those stressors. I think those are the last points I wanted to make. Um, I think you can see that um, my remarks are intended to really save a place for primary care, save a place for practitioners in terms of how we become part of the solution to address social influencers of health and to recognize that we have to invest in terms of models of care that occupy a third space to accelerate a discussion where we can get into some really interesting aspects of how to modulate health and improve health, invest in health. So thanks very much. So we're gonna have these two join each other up on stage. So maybe Dr. Wong, you could start us out and ask Tony one of your questions that you would have of him. Well, I was wondering, Tony, I mean, uh, you did have, as I said, you had kind of a demarcation between the socio-ecologic side of the slide and the right side of the slide in terms of the medical model. 
I made the argument that there's actually potentially kind of a third space that um, straddles between the two. Mm -hmm. Is there any part of my argument that kind of can be inserted into that diagram that you, you uh, shared with us? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm an internist practicing, you know, primary care. Um, and I realize that there are, there's overlap in that little space between those um, two kind of domains, those two frames, the socio-ecological and the medical. Um, I, I think that it depends on the purpose for which you're, you know, using the framework, um, how you sort of accentuate opportunities across that entire spectrum. I think that, uh, you know, when I, when I speak to largely medical groups, I focus on that interface. You know, how do you bring the sort of the clinical space into the community? How do you bring the community into the clinical space? How do you make more relevant interactions in that interface? I also think for a second reason, um, <clears throat> it's important to emphasize that space, and that is that, you know, we have to start where people are. Uh, you, you can't just sort of offer a radical sort of redefinition of, you know, how we allocate $2.8 trillion and expect people to say, okay, let's do it that way. Um, you have to sort of kind of coax the uh, medical model upstream. And, and I have no illusions that that's something that you can do either overnight or even completely. Uh, one of my colleagues, Larry Cohen at the Prevention Institute says, you know, the goal is for everybody to take one step upstream. Um, just think about the ways in which you can actually, as you've described uh, in, in your work and in your presentation, how do you take advantage of that opportunity, that encounter, that posture that you have in the healthcare delivery system at the primary care door? How do you take advantage of that to actually invite both the patient and the community into that interaction? I think that that's important, and I think that that's, quite frankly, where we have to start. Um, but the goal is not to stop there. It's also to look at, you know, the life course, you know, how we treat young children, and then the, the sort of the environments that we allow people to sort of operate in and try to navigate uh, health resources. Um, you know, the thing about children and, and young families. Um, so I think you would make the argument, of course, schools and opportunity, education, et cetera, are critical in terms of the future of, of children relative to the stressors that they actually face. What about some of the work that's being done in terms of clinical settings that really take a proactive stance in terms of identifying children at risk, even ch mothers at risk, even before they've given birth in utero fetus, and i.e. in terms of taking a, an intervention approach in terms of mod modulating or providing the support so that individuals can um, decrease the stressors in their life and thus, you know, have children grow up in really difficult circumstances. Is there a, is there a role for a clinical practice to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that it, it's important in this work not to get caught up in false dichotomies, mm -hmm. not to start thinking about either it's this or it's that. Um, we're smart enough to hold, you know, several competing ideas in our head simultaneously. And you have to be able to do that to, to do this work. One thing that's clear is that for young children, um, the medical model has some real value. The interventions that you can make uh, in early childhood, in the early childhood space to identify problems, to identify learning issues, to identify stressors in the parents, to identify nutrition issues, are critical. Uh, those are, are preventive interventions, and they're, they're critical in that early uh, window of opportunity of the developing brain. All that being said, there are also critical social interventions uh, that can be made in that period and throughout the life of the child and the family to reduce the stressors in the environment that the child is growing up in, amongst the parents, um, in the community. Um, we neglect that period and we leave people on their own. And the consequences are that we end up paying for it as Kaiser's studies, the adverse childhood experience uh, studies show, we end up paying for it in chronic disease burden later on in life, which is way more expensive to try to address, um, and it's a waste of human capital. So the, the argument is that 
you know, let's not engage in false dichotomies. Let's, let's recognize that we, are, we have critical thinking skills and that we can manage um, somewhat um, competing concepts simultaneously in our heads and in our practice and think about the kinds of investments that have dual value, that both identify problems in the early childhood but also help reduce the stressors of parents that are trying to navigate uh, in very complex societies. Maybe there's these conflicting uh, concepts of, in our audience, and I, get to, I like to get a sense of maybe where they're coming from and how they're trying to address this. Love to. Or maybe, we've, maybe we haven't dichotomized enough and make it. <laughs> any, any questions or comments in terms of kind of the dialogue that uh, Tony and I have? Yes. We have a question from our audience. Yeah, I'm not specifically familiar with that particular model, but I'm, I'm familiar with some similar models. Um, and I think they're really important. I, I, I was having a conversation with Chris yesterday about the history of community health centers and how they were really designed um, to carry out that particular strategy. It was really about bringing community together to advocate for improved communities. And you know, in the, while doing that, also provide health care. And somehow in the 80s that flipped, and it became about sort of reimbursable visits and less about sort of trying to improve communities uh, to prevent people from actually being so dependent on healthcare services. So I think that there are, Asian Health Services is a great example of a community health center that sort of still stays true to the original vision of what community health centers were supposed to be. And, and, and I don't think it's easy, by the way. I think this is, is a tough thing to do in a, in a highly competitive and resource-deprived environment. But I, I do think that if we can create and align the incentives for uh, health improvement in the healthcare delivery system, that the systems will naturally gravitate this way because people recognize this you know, in the clinical space. That, you know, there are limited modalities for trying to interact with an individual. And uh, I, I hear from, I'm one of them, but I hear from practitioners every day that they're frustrated that they can't really intervene in this broader space. So these models um, are critical to trying to allow for uh, systems to grapple with some of these problems, but the incentives um, have changed and we need to look at those incentives again. What business models support your arguments, and how can these approaches be financially viable? Well, I'll take a shot at it. First, I think in our journey in healthcare right now, in terms of pretty much pivoting from a fee-for-service, unit-based kind of revenue stream towards health outcomes, that's a positive step forward. How fast that really occurs is a different question. I do think that organizations that are prepaid, invested in terms of health outcomes, i.e. models like Kaiser Permanente, are in a better position because the allocation of resources goes back in terms of where um, one could see that if we go upstream, ultimately that's going to cost less money. Um, in fact, at Kaiser Permanente, we are grappling with this. And we are looking at what we're calling actually social care right now that looks at beyond the medical model and understands that even when people are in the sick care um, kind of modality, that there's so many aspects in the community that are critical for them not to re-enter into the hospital, not to have inordinate number of medical visits. So there is some glimpses of how a medical model, a social care model, can be supported through a business care uh, or a business model. I, I, I entirely agree with that, and I think the last question kind of touched on that a little bit as well. I think it's about aligning incentives, and, and we have a fragmented healthcare delivery system where the incentives are all pointing past each other, and we, we need to reorient um, the interests of the various components of the healthcare delivery system around uh, you know, what Kaiser and other integrated delivery systems are able to do. They're able to focus on what actually improves health, because what improves health is aligned with what saves money, and that's a good thing. Uh, so. I think that those, the business models that align those incentives are the ones that the 21st century will demand. It seems like most of the discussion has been focused on the interface between the social determinants of health and the healthcare system and healthcare model, medical care model. 
Tony brought up the fact that we need to focus more on chronic stress and the impact of chronic stress on somebody's health. Describe to us what that interface looks like of elevating and focusing on chronic stress, both within the community and in the healthcare system. So thank you for, for raising that issue. The, when, when you look at the, um, the population health data, which you know, we do in public health, and we try to understand what are the forces that are influencing people's health outcomes, and you can look across a broad range of health outcomes and see disparities, if you will, in certain populations, and then you try to understand what's common in those populations. You can see them in, in income groups, you can see it in racial groups, African Americans, Native Americans, and some other groups. Um, you see pronounced health disparities. And when you study their, the experience of those uh, populations in this country, you recognize that they have faced barriers that were human-made barriers that are intentionally designed to essentially make it harder for them. Um, and so this whole concept of sort of what does that do to a person when they feel like they are they don't have control in their lives. We, we talk about this concept of agency, the ability essentially to sort of marshal your resources to tackle your challenges and to have the confidence to be able to do that effectively. And the balance between resources and stressors, if you will, is what we're trying to achieve. We don't want people to be completely stress-free because as my friend David Williams says, the person who has no stress in his life is dead. Um, we want people to have the resources to be able to manage the stressors. And that's basically what agency is. It's the balance between those two things. And so the question becomes, what are the opportunities to essentially increase resources or resiliency and decrease stressors? Um, and you have those at the population level, and that's policy. I mean, this whole debate over the Affordable Care Act is still astounding to me um, because we're talking really about trying to get people resources that they can use should they become ill, which you know, virtually everybody will have some experience with illness at some point in their life. So it's not like it's unique to some populations and other populations, we're all gonna experience it. So we're talking about just trying to relieve the stress that people have and thinking that if they become ill, they have some resources to be able to cope with that. In the healthcare delivery setting, and I think Winston can speak to this, there are also opportunities in the encounter between patient and physician or system and, and patient where you can give patients more agency, more control. And all doctors will talk about, you know, the, typically it's a VA hospital, you go to a, see a patient and the patient's like, kind of like sitting there in the chair, it's like, whatever you say, doc, whatever you, whatever you wanna do, doc. And those are the most frustrating patients because they don't own the problem, you know, they don't have agency, they don't feel like they're a partner with you to try to solve this problem. And so their strategies, and, and, and Kaiser is very good at them, and I'm sure Winston can talk about them, to try to actually engage the patient more as an active participant uh, in the problem. And I think that that is the same basic principle that we're talking about in communities, trying to give people a sense of agency. That's why we try to build power. We try to give people a sense of control over those factors that are influencing their lives. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is really interesting because, um, well, I, I don't know how many folks are familiar with the adverse childhood experiences uh, study, but just um, nutshell, was a study was done at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego about 15 years ago that provided a score to uh, adults that had experienced any number of different personal and family uh, instances of trauma. And this included um, whether a parent had been incarcerated, whether a parent had mental health issues, whether um, there was a divorce in the family, whether the individual had been a victim of sexual abuse. Notably, not so much in terms of social trauma, but more in terms of family unit trauma. And no surprise, and this was Kaiser Permanente members, that the higher number of points you accumulated, there was a strong correlation with regards to not only chronic disease, but also use of uh, various substances and, and, and psychological uh, distress. The question then becomes when we see patients like this, how do we be proactive, especially in the most formative years, to provide some sort of buffer that people don't have the consequences of this barrage of psychological stresses. And actually one thing that I'm really intrigued by because the ACE work was an individualized score, 
is actually look at ACE scores based upon geography and based upon community. And I think if you put also within a social framework, how many times has a child been exposed to just hearing gunshots in the neighborhood? Is that associated with a much more uh, risk in terms of eventually developing chronic disease? We haven't grasped this very well, and I think the healthcare team, public health, and community, this is where the interface really occurs. Thank you. So we're going to take uh, one question from our virtual participants. Do public health actors, doctors, nurses, admin, have a specific role in getting communities to engage with local and state government? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think that the, the elements of a public health, health equity practice are basically three. One is that you have to recognize that power actually drives um, a lot of the health outcomes at the population level. So trying to figure out how to build power some of which is to facilitate uh, the ability of communities to participate in decision-making processes, um, which is, it sounds, it's a fancy way of saying helping people shape the conditions in their environments, like helping people participate in the planning board meeting that decides, you know, where a resource is going to be placed, either a, a positive resource like a park or a grocery store or a bike path, what have you, or a negative resource like a waste dump or an incinerator or, or a diesel bus terminal. Um, so the ability to participate in the decision making, A, has the individual benefit of providing agency, a sense of control. B, has the uh, benefit at the population level of just having better outcomes, better decisions being made because more people are participating. Um, so the, the role of the public health practitioner is to recognize this. I mean, public health is really about looking at populations. It's not per se about looking at individuals. And um, when you look at populations, you have to understand what are the factors and forces that shape the overall trajectories of populations. And, and, and when you recognize what they are, your job is to try to improve it. And so, uh, yes, uh, it's, it's critical for public health actors to it help enlist uh, greater participation for communities in decision-making processes. So I'll just say quickly that other two components are um, the ability to part participate directly in the policy-making space to help shape better health outcomes in non-health policies, looking at transportation, housing, a variety of different policies, and, and showing the health impacts of uh, different options uh, that policymakers are making. That's something that public health actors have been doing much more actively, it's certainly in the land use uh, decision making space, but there are other sectors that that needs to happen more. And then the third piece is really looking at sort of the public health institution. And, you know, who are you hiring? Um, you know, how are you sort of in, in ways, you know, discriminating against the populations that you're trying to serve in, in the way you spend your money, the way you hire people, the way you promote people, all that kind of, and that goes for healthcare institutions as well as uh, public health organizations. So we'll take a question from the audience. Okay. Uh, so might be kind of come out of left field, but lately we've seen in the United States the results of this, well, this tremendous uh, separation of powers between levels like federal, state, county, city, and also vertically between subject matters. So we see that states can subvert federal policy, counties can, can subvert state policy, Cities can, you know, all up and down the line, and with even the policy areas, there, like for instance, I think for Denver, just regarding air quality, there might be four regulatory agencies, I believe, and that doesn't count things like citizens groups, interest groups, industry, and so on. So as you move upstream in, away from individual care to systemic factors, how does that, this incredibly varied, fragmented, world of policy players affect that? There's this guy named, by the name of George Kaplan um, who used to run this thing called the Human Population Lab out in uh, Alameda County and with Michigan and he's recently written a paper on just that hypothesis that you know the fragmentation, uh, regional fragmentation of both um, institutions that oversee public health and health outcomes and the siloization of various sectors 
Uh, he did a comparative analysis of different regions across the United States and, and showed a correlation between the more fragmentation you have, the poorer the health of the population in those communities. And so the hypothesis is that when it's so fragmented, it's difficult to come up with collaborative, um, you know, pooled resource solutions. And so I think that there's something to be said of that um, as to how you change that, because uh, there's something in the political culture, particularly in this country, that is afraid of concentrations of, of authority, afraid of concentrations of government power. And so there's a sort of an ethos of sort of like the smaller and more fragmented government is, the better it is. Um, I think that that's a, that's, a, that's a big challenge. So a question from our virtual participants. How do you build power in communities when some in power are unaware or deny such inequities exist? Well, I, I think that's certainly a political organizing question. Um, I do think that uh, it goes back to our social activists <laughs> days, I guess, going back to the 60s and 70s with regards to putting a voice or providing, amplifying the voice of the folks who are most vulnerable. And that's about building political units and structures and movements. And actually, it's very interesting that if you look at the UK, they actually spend a lot of energy looking at how social movements can be integrated into the healthcare discussion, which I think probably um, we could stand to hear a little bit about that. It's going to be a tough road. I mean, given just the venom that I hear every day in, um, across the country and on the news channels. But it is about um, what the endowment's doing in terms of these 14 communities around establishing a voice for youth, establishing a voice for folks that are immigrants, establishing a voice for uh, the people who have been historically marginalized. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that the, you know, the nature of this work is, it's, it's really not that complicated. It's, it's really about optimizing democratic processes and showing the connection between the ability to participate and the, the benefits that that yields in terms of health protective resources. Um, so we live in a democracy. I mean, our, 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 our primary logic about how we make decisions is through participatory government. And we've seen sort of essentially backsliding on participation, you know, over the years. People have been tuning out. And it's not just low-income people, it's, it's many middle-income people Many people in general feel like the, you know, the process doesn't include their voice, doesn't have their interests at heart. Um, and that's a problem for us as a country. So you know, the, the question is, you know, how, do you, how do you convince people in power that you know, a health inequity exists and that um, they have a role in it? You know, we've taken the position that you know, either we convince them or we replace them. I mean, it, it's, it's really, that's what democracy is. So th what's new about this is that the health consequences of inoperable democracy are now starting to reveal themselves um, through various different types of analyses. Thank you. So we have a question from the audience. We could probably have spent a whole hour on this one because I have to tell you, I've been very active in promoting um, medical models uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, population management models that identifies individuals who really could benefit from statins. Uh, and some of you might know this in Colorado as the AOL work that has really been at this core about establishing the best practice in medicine to provide care for the most vulnerable who are, who are at most dis disproportionate risk for heart attacks and strokes. So, in fact, I think the statin study is not necessarily antithetical to the issues that we talked about. It's about establishing the highest quality of medical care that relates to a question of being empowered to ask for that care and to demand for that care. The point in case is actually statins right now are relatively inexpensive at a generic level. Now that doesn't mean that we can just medicalize ourselves out of cardiovascular disease, but it is one of the armamentarium to address cardiovascular burden in this country and in this world, actually. And if you look at developing countries like India, China, they're also grappling with the issue of 
whether statins should be basically part of the drinking water, practically. Um, so I'm enough of a physician and enough buried into evidence-based medicine to say that medications like statins really have a role in improving health. But at the same time, that equation can't be so narrow that there's no issues with regards to looking at behavioral modification, empowerment of patients, and communities demanding the best in the quality of care. Yeah, so I, 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 I agree <laughs> that statins in the medical context are an effective drug. I happen to have genetic reasons that I can't take statins. Um, but I, I agree with that. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's more as sort of an observation in response to your, to your observation, is that what does it say about us as a society that, you know, we can get sort of consensus around, you know, putting statins kind of in the drinking water, but we can't get consensus around how we market, you know, high fat, high sugar, high salt foods to children. Uh, you know, that's protected speech. Uh, so I, I just, it, it begs the question about what our values are, where our priorities are. That's all I would say to that. Okay. So we have another question. How do we move from doing what's cost effective to doing what's right, or can we do both? Wow. <laughs> well, you know, this is a journey. And I don't even know. By the time I get to Medicare, anything's going to change. And that's not that far away from me. <laughs> uh, and it may not change during my lifetime. But I think what it is is that um, actually there's, I mean, there's some reasons to be optimistic. For example, the maps that both Tony and I showed were not possible just 10 years ago. So if we actually harness some aspects of data collection, which, you know, Tony, again, is a geek for, even this whole thing about big data in terms of really declaring in front of our face what is the real manifestation of disease, illness, and, and associations with wealth, I mean health, wealth, <laughs> health and wellness, that we might actually have a real honest discussion around what keeps us well and what keeps communities thriving and the issues of the imbalances of power to replicate the disparities that we see. So maybe there's an aspect of this where, because health is being aggregated in terms of the data and how we understand illness, that is going to beg the question of having better models that are associated with investments in health and the cost model. Yeah, I think that the question sort of infers that there's some conflict between cost effectiveness and, and what's right. And I think that there's probably some truth to that. I, but if you just look at what's cost effective that we don't do, uh, you know, early childhood uh, is cost effective. It's, it saves you $17 for every $1 you invest. That's, that's the opinion of right-wing think tanks as well as progressive think tanks. There's consensus around that, but we don't do it. We know that um, investing in keeping kids in school and, and reducing dropouts is cost effective. Um, people are much more productive and there are much fewer societal costs associated with having to manage kids that don't have a high school education. Yet we don't do it. So I, I mean, I think that if we, if we did what was cost effective, I think we'd be in pretty good shape. <laughs> um, but we don't, you know, never mind doing what's right. We don't do what's cost effective. So I think that the, the issue is deeper than that. I think we have to understand, you know, politically, how we make decisions. And I, and I think that that's, until we understand that and grapple with that and recognize that, you know, we have sort of walked away from true democracy, I, I think we're going to be constantly bickering about things on the margins. I have a question from our audience. So my organization has been working with the state of Colorado on developing our state health innovation plan. And one of the big concepts in that plan is to create opportunities for better coordination between the public health delivery system and the clinical care delivery system in order to achieve population health goals and over time to work that into reimbursement systems so we could eventually perhaps move to kind of a community-based accountable care 
organization. Yes. Yes. And I'm very curious to know if either of you have seen successful models of that elsewhere in the country. There is some limited success models, and I don't know if you actually have heard um, about the uh, Public Health Primary Care Playbook, the Dumont um, funded, Dumont Foundation uh, funded initiative that's being um, engineered by uh, Duke University and uh, Dr. Lloyd Michener. So we have some examples where, for example, asthma care was um, proactively intervened with regards to the environment. And actually, Tony's doing some of that work, I think, in Fresno as well. They're limited, very limited. And I think part of the problem is that if you talk to physicians and you talk to public health practitioners, they basically speak different languages. There's not even a common lexicon. In terms of, if you said population health to many of my colleagues at Kaiser Permanente, they would say, oh, you're talking about individuals with diabetes? And if I talk to a public health person, they said, no, we're talking about Alameda. So there's a lot of difficulty in terms of where is that ground in which it can take place. I also say, too, when's the last time a primary care doc, if they can't even name their public health um, director, probably. And there's... Um, little interaction in terms of a public health person saying, do you know what the rates of asthma are in your practice? And let's just figure this out because maybe there is a win-win here in terms of you having to deal with fewer patients in the ED, you having some incentives to keep people out of the ED, and from the public health department having maybe built in eventually some revenue come into the public health department in terms of these care outcomes. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that entirely. I think that the, the real challenge is that the public health infrastructure is, is decimated. It's, you know, it's insubstantial, and particularly the medical side of it. I mean, there's a lot around the sort of environmental, sanitation, restaurant inspection, you know, the sort of traditional kind of environmental health. Um, there's some around you know, maternal and child health and some around um, emergency preparedness. But the, the real kind of medical side of it has... It, it, it's, it's even arguable that it never developed um, because, you know, while we've moved from sort of a 19th century kind of uh, epidemiological profile in this country, which is, you know, that largely of acute infectious diseases, um, to a 21st century, which is largely around chronic disease and disease management, uh, the healthcare system is slowly moving that way. The public health system hasn't moved that way at all. Uh, there's literally no funding for the number one, two, three, four, and five top killers of Americans um, in the public health system. There's funding for tuberculosis, there's funding for HIV, there's funding for sexually transmitted diseases, 19th century problems with the exception perhaps of HIV. There's no funding for, for preventing cardiovascular disease except for sporadic tobacco uh, funds. There's no funding for cancer prevention, again, except for sporadic uh, tobacco funds, stroke, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, accidents. There's no core funding structure for that. So as a consequence, you don't have in the public health infrastructure expertise that's developing up around the management of the 21st century disease threats. So it's hard for the public health system to interface with the healthcare delivery system when there's really nobody to dance with on the public health side. Um, and that, that again is, I think, a values problem in this country that we've ignored public health. We've just sort of pushed it to the side, except when there's an outbreak of tuberculosis and everybody's like, where's the public health system? So I'm afraid we're run out of time. So I'd like for everyone to thank Dr. Zaiten and Dr. Wong for their, their presentation. <laughs>
Um, also, we'll make this available. I think we usually have this, we'll have this entire event um, online and the live streaming of it on, on our website in the next couple of weeks. Um, I also want to remind everyone that we do have a survey, and this is where you can give us some good feedback on, on speakers or how you just like the event in general. So if you could fill that out, that's incredibly helpful for us as we plan new events and incredibly helpful for us into the future. Um, and before I, I, I wrap up here, I just want to thank a couple of people that are really integral to making this happen. Uh, Patricia Martinez, Elisa Bourne, Jill Johnson, and Tara, who you don't see, um, who's helping everyone who's live streaming to make sure that their live streams are working. They've been incredibly helpful in, in, in helping us put this together. Um, I also want to recognize Courtney Ricci and uh, Maggie Frazier, who are the other two legs of the three-legged stool that helps to put all of these events together. So thanks to those guys. So again, thanks again for all of you joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you um, being patient with the cranes that they're building outside and finding parking. And we looked forward to seeing you too at future events. So thank you. <laughs>